So without needing to hear any anything more from me, AJ, I'm going to hand it off to Warren. Uh, enjoy yourselves tonight, folks. I will be here to help you out. If you have any uh, tech issues, shoot me a note in the chat and I'll help you out. But otherwise, enjoy your time. And Warren, thanks so much for being here. Thanks, AJ. Hi, everyone. Uh, thanks for joining us here on a Friday night. Excellent. It's a cold one here in Canmore, minus 25. Uh, I think there's crazy weather going across the, <laughs> the country right now from plus 19 and places all the way to here. So um, crazy winter coming ahead. But, you know, the, the end of the day, uh, I can't wait to ski with you and, and hear from you guys as you ski throughout the winter. In tonight's session on how to train, we're all, all crazy nuts. We want to develop our skiing to become the to get for the season there. So look into it. Here's what tonight first and foremost day training most out of it you know the talk tonight covers both ourselves but also the students that we're working with is we're then going to get into how Hey folks, uh, just experiencing a little bit of a tech glitch with Warren's audio. I'm not sure what's up. Uh, hang on two moments and we'll try to get that sorted for you. My apologies. Just a moment. In my skiing and your skiing and the skiing of our students, they're yours. That's what you have figured out to get around the corner, to slow yourself down, to get around an object, right? These are the things that we see in our skiings. And, you know, we could list off a bunch of them, like, you know, he's leaning back or rotation or the tail is sliding out at the end of the turn. Those are all symptoms. But at the end of the day, those are mine. Now, that's what I'm doing, and I've become an expert at it. That's why I do it. <laughs> so, you know, to me, I kind of compare it to taking a stick from a dog or a sharp knife from a child. Not that I've ever given my children sharp knives. But, you know, the harder you tug on that, the harder they hold on to it. The only way to get that from them is to offer them something better, right? If you give a child a different toy, something a little bit more shiny or a nice ball to the dog, then they're going to let go of the thing that you don't want them to have. And they're going to take what it is you want them to have. Okay? And the symptoms, you know, chasing a symptom around, I call that the, the, the chicken or egg conundrum, right? Where uh, it ends up being a very negative approach to skiing because we're talking about the things that people already do. And it's usually something negative. How about that? Something strange is going on here this evening. Sorry, folks. There we go. Here's what I mean about the chicken or egg conundrum. Right? So we're talking about symptoms. If we look at the skier on the bottom of the arc here, potentially, right, we see a whole bunch of things. You might see that their downhill foot is behind them. Um, maybe they're tipped inside a little bit too much. Their inside hand is too low. Uh, their ski, it looks like their downhill ski is, is losing grip. Right. So one of the things we think, well, let's go back up the arc and maybe we'll find the cause of that. Okay, so then we go back up the arc. And when, what do we see here? Well, we see a few more symptoms. We see leaning in. You, you see the, the ski tips are diverging. Right. Means that they're maybe a little bit too open. Um, and, you know, on the inside ski, their hips are back. You know, so you say, OK, well, what's causing that sim those symptoms? Well, let's look back up the arc. We look back up at the arc and here's my student at the the end and they're rotated. They're on the uphill foot. So the only way for them to start the turn is to rotate again. And that might put them back and behind, which then causes what you see in the bottom of the arc. So symptoms lead to symptoms. And in my opinion, it's a very negative way to go about our teaching day. 
So what I want to do is I want to add a move that I don't currently have in my scheme, right? So instead of fixing the stuff that I'm doing, I'm going to add something that I don't do. I think of a puzzle, right? You have, you get your puzzle, your hundred piece puzzle, you take the lid off, you put the lid on the table. That's what it's supposed to look like. Then you get your pieces all over the place. You start putting the four corners in and away you go and you get to the end and you've only got 99 pieces. One piece is missing. And it doesn't matter how you, if you take that puzzle apart and you put it together in a different way, it'll never look like the box, you know, the picture on the box because something's missing. So when we go down that road of replacing something or adding something that is missing to our skiers, then we have what we call contribution and effect, right? So we contribute to the arc and then we uh, have, what? I was just told to turn off my camera. Um, so we have that, you know, that contribution and effect where we, we add a piece, it has something to do for us and that should positively affect our turn shape. Right? So that's an incredibly positive way to go about our skiing and adding something to our own skiing or that of our students. In order for us to have that, the box up, right, the picture of the, the box so we know the pieces of the puzzle that we want to add, we've got to have that as a visual in our own mind. So first and foremost, we talked about it a bit last week, we want to have our three points of contact. Then we have moves, and I call them our three full-time moves. These are moves that we make all the time, whether it's uh, a bump run or powder or short turns or long turns. Then we need to have a connection move, right, to get our balance to the outside ski. We need to have some way to release our center of mass from inside our base of support. So there's a move to release, and then there's a move to create a new platform. And then we have this part-time move. Right? And that's twisting the ski on the surface of the snow. And I call that a part-time because I don't have to use it all the time. So let's take a look at this video and that'll give us an idea of what I mean. In order for us to add a piece to the puzzle, first and foremost, we need to know what those pieces are. We have to have a visual in our mind of the movements that we make in different parts of the arc, the direction change, the release, how we create our platform. So we can choose the piece that our student is missing and then work on that and, and add it to their skiing. I find there's three full-time moves. There's the ability to connect to the outside ski, the ability to release our arc or you know, our center of mass from inside the arc, uh, a move to create a platform. Those are full-time moves. Those are the moves that I make all the time, regardless of the turn shape, regardless of uh, the snow conditions, how fast I'm going, etc. Then I have a part-time move. And that part-time move is twisting the ski on the surface of the snow because there's a lot of times, be it on a, sh on a steep piece of terrain, maybe bumps where we have to make a smaller arc than what our natural bending of our ski is going to do for us. So let's take a look at these three full-timers and one part-time move. So the first one is connecting to the outside ski, right? This is kind of that area of the turn we talked about last week, that direction change. Then I need to be able to move to, it's a slight bend of the downhill leg. There's a balance on the, the new uphill ski. And then the third move is rolling the ski onto its edge, using the adductor group of muscles to do so. Okay, so we're moving to connect to the outside ski. That's the cornerstone, I believe, to all of my puzzle pieces. Then there's that slight bend and also a balance on the new ski to help us release that arc. And then the third one again is here where we roll the ski over and use the adductor group of muscles to create our platform. So then let's look at, here's my part-time move, right? The ability to actually twist the ski on the surface of the snow, like I said, because you're not always able to carve every single turn, right? So let's take a look here where we just twist the ski on the surface of the snow, take it from here, you know, looking at the, you know, the direction that the ski is, is pointing there. It's the turning of the leg. You know, the hips also turn a little bit 
too, because we need to stay balanced over the outside ski and to there, right? So now we've twisted the ski. Now it's pointing down the hill a little bit more and that allows us to cheat the arc a little bit before we connect to it and get the ski more engaged in the in the turning effect. So from you know, looking at here to there, that's the key component here to our part-time move, that fourth move in skiing. All right? As I said, you know, sometimes you're going to need this in short turns, right? But watch as we, you know, in slow motion here as we turn or twist the ski on the surface of the snow, you know, taking a look that the, you know, the hip isn't always turning too, too much, right? But it has to turn a little bit or else we'll end up with our skis twisted too much across our body and uh, we won't be able to balance on the outside ski and the hip ends up behind us a little bit too. Okay, so there we go. There's our four pieces of the puzzle, three are full timers, use them all the time everywhere you go, add the fourth one if and when you need it. Balance on the outside ski. Okay, so there's our puzzle pieces. That's what we're looking for when we're watching our skier ski. Those are the movements that we're trying to add to our skiing when we're out training ourselves. So let's take a look. I've got a, a video here um, of an example of adding a missing piece to uh, somebody skiing. Uh, this is my... in order for us to add a piece to the puzzle. First and foremost, sorry, we went to this first video again. Here we go. Great. So this is this is my good friend Jay. He's uh, he's a level two working towards his level three. Here we go. This is where we start adding a piece to the puzzle. So here's an example. This is a great friend of mine, Jay. He's a CSI level two working towards his level three. And here's a, an image of him or video of him skiing the first time that we met. Okay, so you can see, you know, he's relatively balanced, right? Getting the skis to turn a little bit. Things are going pretty well for Jay here. Now let's take a closer look at areas that I want to develop. Okay, so here's an area in here that I'd like to add a piece to the puzzle to Jay's skiing. Okay, we're going to take another look here. We'll look on the, the other side, same area. There we go, just in here, right? So this is where I want to add a piece to the puzzle. When I look at Jay's skiing, there, there's just something missing, right? We could look at different things and you could as we talked about, pick out potential symptoms and things that you may or may not like about the skiing. But I always look at a skier and I look for the pieces that are missing. And right now I'm looking at that piece of connection. So here, let's take a, a watch here as Jay skis past us. Right, if I can get some connection, then the ski might grip the snow a little bit more and have a more positive turn shape, right? You know, a little bit more um, of an immediate turn as he connects. So this is the area of the turn that I'm visualizing in my mind. These are the, the moves that I want to try to add to, to Jay, try to get him to balance more in here towards the outside ski. That's where we're going to go with Jay's skiing. Okay, so there he is there. All right, so this is the move that I'm going to start to add. I'm going to get him statically, make sure that the body can move that direction. You know, here's ironic. This is beautiful. <laughs> I never even noticed this until I watched the, the video the first time. But look at this skier in here that went past, right? Can you imagine if we got this skier to connect to the outside ski? They'd be able to balance on it, on it a little bit more too. So just an added bonus there on that video. There we go. So that's the move we want to add to Jay. So I worked that into, into Jay's skiing. We did some drills and, and we'll get to that a little bit later on here too, some of the drills. But, um, you know, this is, you know, the after shot now. There, you can see, you know, we're starting to get a little bit more balance. You look at the outside ski here. It's bending right from the front of the ski. Okay, so everything is, you get a little bit of counter in here and, but you know, he's connecting to the, to the outside ski. 
Hey, let's look there. There's your before and after shot, right? From just simply adding that movement to his scheme. Hey, okay, check out on the other side here. Wait one more. There we go. So getting closer, there's more weight to the outside ski, but you can see a big spray here on the inside ski. You know, that tells me there's still a little bit of weight over there. So we haven't completely gotten our weight to or the feeling of our weight to the outside ski. And, um, but let's take a look at the before and after shot here again with Jay. So still getting better, right? So here, most of the, you know, more weight on this ski. You know, the, the outside skis kind of moved away from him a little bit. So we're getting much, much closer to where we want to be. And that's pretty normal, right? Where we're all going to develop one side probably faster than the other. Um, so we just have to continue to, to work that side. There we go, finish that run off. And then I'm going to show you a clip of Jay here uh, on a much steeper slope. This one's a, it's a, you know, very steep black run, good snow conditions, but we can see that he's still able to keep some of those, you know, that connecting to the outside ski more so on the left foot than the right foot, but we're certainly making a big difference in Jay's skiing. And if we take a look here, you know, right at the end, you can look at some of the similarities, right? From the picture that I have, you know, in my mind of where I want Jay to get to, you can start seeing quite a bit of similarity. Jay might even be bending his ski better than I am on that one. So anyways, there you go. That's how we add a piece to the puzzle. Super positive environment. You know, we never talk about the things that anybody's doing wrong. You know, it's an easy introduction. Here, Jay, here's something I want you to add to your skiing. We show them what it looks like. We tell them what it may or may not feel like. We tell them what the effect will be on the outside ski. And we just start developing as opposed to changing or fixing a mistake that somebody's been making. Great. So there you go. That's the advantage to adding a piece to the puzzle. And it's a very positive approach, right? Where I say, hey, Jay, you know, here's something that I want to add to your skiing. I show him what I want him to add, uh, discuss it a little bit, tell him things that he might feel, um, what it's going to do for his skiing and what the outcome is. And that is that contribution and effect as opposed to trying to take something away from Jay, a symptom as an example, but inserting a piece of the puzzle that he doesn't have. So when we know in our own skiing uh, what it is that we want to, to add, um, then let's look at how we schedule a training day. So this is a day where I go out and I'm focused on working on something in my skiing, adding a piece of the puzzle to my skiing. And, you know, as opposed to just a, a day where I'm just going to go ski and, and have uh, a free, say, free ski sort of day, this is the schedule that I would put forward uh, anytime I'm training myself, but I'm also using this type of format when I'm training. We're going to start with a physical warm up. It doesn't have to be a long warm up. Um, and but there's a few things that we want to consider in our warm up. Now these are some big terms, and we'll make them super simple. Uh, plyometrics. Those are the things like hopping around, right? Things that are going to get your muscles activated. Eccentric contractions. Big word. A uh, big term. Um, but what that simply means is that there are times while we're skiing that when our muscles are contracting, they're actually getting longer, right? And one of the examples is that is when I'm bending my legs, my quadricep actually is getting longer when it's under load. Okay, so we have to go, you know, warm up that type of movement pattern. And then a quasi isometric, an isometric contraction, if you took your tubes and uh, push them together and push really, really hard, but they don't move either way, right? That's an isometric contraction. Uh, Quasi-isometric means that it's, it happens, but for a short period of time. Now, we don't want to be frozen in any one position at any time. And there really isn't that much time where we are. But there might be times where we uh, have, get to the bottom of our flexion, as an example, and you're paused there for a split second, that would be a quasi-isometric. So I'm going to show you another video. 
And uh, this is going to give you an idea of my training day and my uh, story, my the warm up, the physical warm up component of my training day. Here's my physical warm up. I do quite a lot of these actually every day before I get going, ideally just before I get on snow. Uh, sometimes the, I know that right now with COVID and the, the day lodge, it's hard to find a spot. Minus 25, pretty chilly outside to do it. But try to find time to get this going, even if it's just 10 minutes. Go through a couple of these exercises to get things firing up a little bit. Okay, So here we go. Let's take a look at some of the, the exercises I do to get warmed up. You know, from one leg, explode a little bit, land, you know, where you try to balance and capture your balance. You know, trying to find when I land, you know, something like this with a you know, dropping down off a little step. You know, we're landing with some force, right? Because we're under load a lot while we're skiing. Get everything working together here. So we take off balanced, land balance. It's not about moving forward really far or backwards really far. It's more about just moving, you know, and balancing, stomp that landing, right? Find the balance point and then take off again. I like this one here going from, you know, the sense of one outside ski to the next. Of course, in skiing, we have balance on both skis, you know, a lot of the time, but the primary uh, where leg where you're going to feel most of the weight is definitely going to be under your outside foot. Speed things up a little bit, right? Get your heart rate up, get your reaction time up a little bit, right? I love this skater one. It's, it's actually harder than it looks when you land to stomp that landing and stay balanced. And when I start doing these warm ups, I'm picturing what I'm going to be doing. Where is this going to be helpful for me while I'm skiing? This one here forces the upper body and lower body to dissociate because there's a force pulling my upper body towards the rack there with the elastic, you know, it's not a lot different than the twisting forces that we have in skiing, right? Where we have to be able to dissociate the upper and the lower body. This one starts to, you know, we start to see, you know, the, you know, some of the core starts to engage. The glutes definitely are starting to work in here. Get the hip range going a little bit. This is the adductor group of muscles working on both sides a little right here where we use that at the start of the turn where we're rolling the leg. This one gets the glutes firing. You know, at the hop, you, you know, the film is sped up a little bit, but you hold it for a count of two or three seconds and uh, that gets, you know, that more of that quasi isometric type training going where we had some plyometrics a little bit earlier. Man, skiing reaction time is is in, <laughs> really important, right? Bumps, short turns, crud, ice. So something that gets you moving a little bit faster, explosive, reactionary. This one here gets you to have to balance a little bit quicker. The squatting process, lots of that going on in skiing. You know, slow on the way down. That's the eccentric load. And then balance at the bottom for a split second and back up. Right, so different parts of the arc you can see on the in the image there in the video as we're going down. Take that imag you know, imagery into your head. You know, back here in skiing, you can see a lot of the ranges of motion we went through in the warm up. Super important if you want to be able to get out there and put it final form and get yourself skiing down the slope. Uh, that's where you need to go. So get that warm up done before you get outside. Trick. Great. Uh, you know, I, like I said, there's it's tough right now for sure. If it's a super cold day, uh, finding a spot indoors, you, know, you might want to do some of that physical warm up before you leave your house. If you don't have a super long drive to the, the ski resort, um, but get it in right. Get that going, because it, not only is it going to help you when it's time for you to add a piece to the puzzle, but we think about safety, right? Keeping yourself safe, free of injury. Uh, it's incredible for yourself, for longevity in skiing, um, and also for the resort. You know, if you're working at a resort, we want to keep ourselves safe and injury-free all season. So after I've done my physical warm-up, then I get my skis on, right? And the skiing warm-up is not final form right away. Most definitely not. I'm going to ensure that I've got my three points of contact. First and foremost, I've got to get there. 
From there, I'm going to start practicing some of my skiing movements, but on skis and sliding. I'm going to do some skidded arcs. I'm going to do some carved arcs. I'm going to do some big ones. I'm going to do some small ones. So let's take another look at another video here that explains it a little bit better with some images. <laughs> Here's my skiing warm up. As we talked about before, those three points of contact are super important. Our heel pad, our first met head, and of course, when we start looking at, you know, in the boot, you know, shin contact at all times. So during my skiing warm up, first and foremost, always making sure that I have my three points. I start with my stomp exercise, right? You step down, put the skis on, try and land three points of contact, stay balanced. Can you get that one leg going? Then I get sliding, one to two runs. It depends on your terrain available to you, how long your runs are, where you're at. A little bit of carved going, but still flat, easy green. Throw in somewhere you have to twist the ski a little bit, a little bit more of a skidded arc, so we kind of get that range from a skid to a carve. Add a little bit of speed as I add speed. Start to move, you know, some of those movements we did in our warm up. you know, connecting to the outside ski, maybe a bit of a bend. Balance on the outside ski, maybe get up onto one ski here, right? So, you know, that's the idea. It's just to get the body moving on skis. It's not final form right away. Absolutely not. It's not a hundred percent speed. It's not super steep terrain. I always go from big arcs to small arcs and vary it up a little bit, you know, maybe big to small, back to big again. And uh, again, depending on the terrain. Uh, that you have available one to two runs. That's all it takes. Yeah, so you can take that, like I said, one to two runs uh, may take you three or four, depending on the length of terrain that you have available to you. So now we've gone through, I, I'm physically warmed up. I've got my muscles working appropriately for skiing. I get uh, moving on my skis a little bit, finding that balance, three points of contact, getting some of those movements going. Now I want to add the piece to the puzzle, right? So the development component of my training day. I keep it on an easy groomed run, green, blue, whatever it takes. And here are the components to that part of your training day. Remember, we need to know we're going to ski with precision. Okay, precision means I know what piece of the puzzle I'm going to add. I know where in the arc I'm going to add it. I know how fast I'm going to make that move. And I know how much of that move I'm going to make. I'm going to ski with intention. And the intention means that what are the results of that move in that part of the arc, that speed of, of movement, and also that amount of movement. I also need to choose my intensity, right? So uh, what I mean by that is, you know, different times of the day, different days from day to day, I may feel a little bit more physically tired or ready to go. I might also, you know, my brain might be a little bit tired and not ready to go. So, but I always want to self-evaluate that and train near the end or the, the top of that, of your intensity zone. And lastly, know that contribution and effect. All of those above three will tell me, you know, is my corridor going to get wider? Or is it going to get narrower? Am I going to spend more time going down the slope or a little bit less time down the slope? So all of these must contribute to the effect. And then I choose a drill. So drills, you know, if here's my formula for, for drills. One, can the drill exaggerate the move that I want to add to my skiing? Can it isolate a part of the turn? or just that specific movement? Can my drill be repeated uh, 100 times? Can I repeat the move multiple times in an arc? It all depends. And lastly, again, I have to know contribution and effect. If I give this move to my arc, what's going to happen to my turn shape and my ski performance? Here's a video to show the, and illustrate this one. Well, I've done my physical warm up, so I've put my body through the motions, activated the muscles. I've gone out skiing. I've done a couple of runs where I've got my body starting to move and simulate what's going to happen on snow. 
And uh, so now it's time to hit that positive development part, part of my training day. Uh, this is the same sort of thing that I did with Jay in the video that we saw before. So I'm going to take you through the drills. But here's Warren, right? So <laughs> there's uh, Warren not having a great day and Warren having a better day, right? And here the hip is, is a little bit positive. Sir, I'm going to pause that. Uh, somebody must have their microphone on because we're hearing the... Uh, the sound twice here. So I'm going to move this back just a little bit. So you hear it, but if somebody has their microphone on, uh, it'd be great if you could turn that off, please. That we saw before. So I'm going to take you through the drills, but here's Warren, right? So <laughs> there's uh, Warren not having a great day and Warren having a better day, right? And here the hip is is a little bit too open. I'm tipped to the inside, not a lot of balance on the outside ski. And what I want to add is get in here, Right, with that connection to the outside ski. So that's what we're going to do. That's our goal because we have that piece that we want to add. We have the visual of what we want it to look like. So we need to, from there, add the movement to get us there. So let's get things started. I'm going to you know, go through an exaggeration drill. This one's isolating that move, right? Um, just keeping it to one spot so I'm not in motion yet. Stomp the landing, three points of contact. And here's what we showed you last week where, you know, how do you know when the movement that you're adding is correct or not, right? How do you know that the drill is going to give you the piece of the puzzle that's required? Well, I look at this here. Here's me skiing, having a good run. And uh, here's me doing the drill. Remember, I tip this up onto onto the edge a little bit. And boom, right? You see the similarities in between, you know, the, the drill and actual skiing. So I find sometimes drills, uh, some people create drills that are probably more difficult than skiing itself. So I try to make sure that my drill imposes the new mo movement pattern that I need to add to my skier. Nothing more, nothing less. It doesn't have to be crazy difficult. And uh, so from that isolated, now I start moving a little bit. And remember, we said that drills should be, you know, it should exaggerate as well, right? So, you know, getting this, you know, thinking of dropping the tips down towards the second buckle on the bottom of your boot there, that really forces me to connect to the outside ski and it exaggerates the move probably more than I would have when I'm skiing. But it, again, you've got to go to one end of the, from one end of the spectrum to the other to add a new move because this is a move that some skiers don't have. So you've got to show them and get them, the drill should be full spectrum, right? And uh, so from here, um, I probably have done a thousand of these <laughs> drills. You know, that's the repetition component, you know, over and over and over. So, you know, and as I compare back to, this is the that image I showed earlier, that's where I wanted to get. Here's the drill, a lot of similarities here in the skiing, probably a little bit more uh, connection, a little bit deeper uh, in the drill than here, full speed skiing. But again, that's the point behind a drill. So take a look, move to, you know, connect to the outside ski there. And oh, starting there, right, even early on in the arc, starting to get that shape that we were looking at much earlier, right? So always take it, you know, the piece of the puzzle, put it into the skier, put it back into full skiing and make sure that that's what you needed and wanted to add. There we go. So we develop our new move, right? We're, that we're, we're adding to our skiing. And from there, when do we know to take the development portion of our day into performance portion of our day? Because we need to always take ourselves from, from the part where we're thinking, you know, inch by inch and millisecond by millisecond of the move that we're trying to, to add. And at some point we have to put it into performance mode. Okay? So if you know, you go is my plan. <laughs> Meaning that if I've had a couple of turns during the drill that I was intentional about and I got the results that I was looking for, then I know it's time to move on because I understand that when I give X, Y is the result. 
So there's kind of a couple of forms of, of training that I'll discuss here briefly. Block training is uh, probably the best example I could give you would be uh, when I was coaching uh, basketball, right? Where you would have um, your, your player standing on the free throw line and they're going to you know, practice their free throws. Right, practice the the follow through movement with the, the the hand and the wrist, and you know sink their baskets. Maybe they start with one, and they just keep training and training and training uh, until they get ten out of ten, as an example. Okay, but what happens then is if I was to then maybe pass the ball to my uh, to my athlete, and they have to make a jump shot, do you think they're going to sink ten out of ten right off the bat? Probably not. Um, we're going to probably miss a few because even though the motion to throw the basketball is the same, we've added a variable. And then we go backwards just a little bit. So what we want to be able to do is as soon as we understand the movement pattern and what it's supposed to do for us, we get into variable training. And variable training looks like this, right? One variable at a time. And here are some of the things that I can vary. I can vary where in the turn I make my new move. Now, obviously, there are some moves that go above the fall line, some that would go below the fall line. But within that area that the move belongs, I might do it a little bit sooner. I might do it a little bit later. I could vary the degree of my movement. So I could do a little bit more. I could do a little bit less. And I could also vary the rate. I could move a little bit faster. I could move a little bit slower. And all of those will have a different effect. So that's why it's important for us to do one at a time. And as we do that, we start to understand, again, contribution and effect. Where I make the move, how much I make the move, how fast I make the move, what is the result with my turn shape and my level of ski performance. Is my turn shape a little bit bigger or smaller? Is my turn a little bit more carved or a little bit more skidded as a result? I can vary terrain. I could keep the three uh, variables above, the where, the degree, and the rate. I could keep those all the same from my, my training component you know, on the green run and maybe go to a blue run. I might go from and stay on a green run, but go to a green run that has a little bit more crud. I might even stay on a green run and go through some small bumps along the way. But again, one variable at a time. It's super important that we evaluate our outcome. And again, that's the turn shape, the speed, and our level of ski performance, carved or skidded. And once I've done that part of my training day, then I can create the if-then scenarios. So as I'm skiing along and I'm doing a top to bottom and the run might start green, go to blue, down to a black pitch, and then I go around the corner, and the bottom section hasn't been groomed or I go to the other side of the slope and it hasn't been groomed yet, as I'm skiing down, I can start looking ahead and deciding if I speed up my move. If I do more of it, if I do it a bit earlier, if I do it a bit later, then I might be able to control my speed as I go from blue to black. I might be able to maintain my speed as I go from black along a long green flat section as well. Those are the if then scenarios. So that's my training day in a nutshell. You know, we've got to start with positive development. Okay? And that's not only for you, that's for your students as well. Add a move that your skiing doesn't already have. Okay? That's going to keep it positive and very rewarding. We start with our physical warm up maybe 10 minutes, maybe 15 minutes, whatever it takes for you to get your body moving. I have days it takes a lot longer to get rolling in the morning to get the joints moving. Um, but again, this is to keep me safe and to ensure that I don't get injured and to ensure that my students don't get injured. Then I shift into my skiing warm up, And during that skiing warm up, I start making some of my skiing moves. They don't have to be perfect. Um, you don't have to be going really fast and it's certainly not final form. From there, I shift into my development portion of my day where I pick a drill where I'm really focusing on adding that one piece of the puzzle that I don't currently have. I need to know, you know where it is, so have that intention. I need to be precise with it. Right? I need to know what's going to happen as a result of my move. 
and I need to just weigh in on the intensity. I need to, you know, take note of where my body is feeling physically and where my head is at in the game. If we don't have those pieces to the puzzle, if we don't have that step where in our development, if we don't know what our move is supposed to do for us, then we run the risk of doing too much of it, or we run the risk of not doing enough of it. And then we're just training a move for the sake of the move, as opposed to the desired outcome based on our turn shape. All of this then I shift into performance mode and I take one variable at a time and I try to move it around the mountain. I try to move the different things within the, 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 the arc itself and create those if then scenarios. And that is taking a piece of the puzzle and starting to use it. And that's exactly what we need to know as we go out to progress uh, as a skier. I look at my training day, it usually takes about three hours to go through something like this, plus or minus. Um, I try not to, I definitely don't take a lunch break uh, during this. I go three hours uh, straight through. Um, when we hit the, the end of the three hours, you'll know it when, you know, you know if you are trying to be uh, ski with an intention and ski precise and, it's, and you had it earlier on in your training day, and you're starting to lose it, it's probably physically, mentally, that exhaustion is just starting to kick in. So find a, a, a block of time that you can go straight through, have a little granola bar or something in your pocket, have a bottle of water at the bottom of the slope or in a bag at the top of the hill, and that's going to help you get through that three-hour time period. So um, that's, the, uh, that's the session for this evening. Uh, tech talk number three coming up December 22nd, same time. And what we're going to discuss now is now that we've done our training, how do we self-evaluate our progress? How do we know that we're actually getting what it is that, uh, that we're hoping to get without having your trainer right beside you? Um, again, you know, if you got your camera here, you can take a, off your phone, take a quick picture of my contact information. A few people reached out last time to clarify some questions. Happy to do so. And uh, if you're looking to uh, ski this, this winter, I, I've got a bunch of camps coming up. You can find them on warrenjobit.com. So thanks again for spending a, uh, a Friday evening with us. And thank you so much to, to AJ and CSI Ontario. Super progressive uh, idea here to, uh, to get these tech talks going. And uh, yeah, have a great a uh, great week and hopefully see you next week on tech talk number three aj i'm gonna hang it over to you bud awesome thanks warren thanks so much and thanks for the uh great positive remarks coming in for warren uh lots of love for you there buddy in the chat so i'll let you review those we're gonna move to uh a, you know as many questions as there there might be within reason um i'm gonna post a few up as they come in so if you don't know how to find that that question feature on your sidebar you should see chat q a polls and handouts um if you move to the the q a function you can post a question um under polls there's some some surveying that we're doing in handouts there's some information you can take home but under q a i've got a couple coming your way and i'm going to post those up right now warren um and there have been a couple of questions about recordings uh, if you view this evening, uh, you'll actually receive a link to this recording. And there, there was a little audio glitch at the start of the session. Um, in the recording, that should be resolved because there is a buffer on the recording time. So check that out and you'll get a, a clean the first couple, I think 20, 30 seconds there was a little uh, jumbled on us. Uh, and if you haven't checked it out, the first session is available to you as well. So you're welcome to check that out if you missed it. Um, so Warren, I think our, our first question, um, question about the carve training system, not sure what you're, whether you're familiar with it and whether that would be a, a training aid to consider. Yeah, that's a, that's a really cool question. Uh, I've worked with athletes, uh, and, and, um, they you know, ski instructors in the last couple of years that are using the carve system. Um, I think it is a, it's, it's a great tool as long as you understand how that fits into your, your understanding of contribution and effect. Um, it'll be really important to you know, take the data that you have and know exactly what movement you're going to need to use to move, you know, to, to 
achieve the the new set of data that uh, that you're looking for. But definitely, there's a lot of people out there using it. I see that as being a, uh, a a cool way to move forward in the future and something that'll help a lot of people. Awesome. Um, next question. We have a uh, James is posting one up. So, do you ever move from performance back? And, and back into development if the final result um, starts to taper off on you, Warren? Um, potentially. It depends on the uh, the time of the day, how long I've been out training. I think when we start to lose it, uh, what happens is we're just tired. Maybe we're overthinking of it. Uh, and we don't really notice that. happening to us a little bit faster so i tend not to i tend to try to keep what i'm training each day the piece of the puzzle very simple and it's only one piece of the puzzle right so uh to keep my day super um focused and not overdo it too much so occasionally depends on again the time of the day and your the level of intensity that you think you can train on um but outside of that uh, likely not too often do i flip back and forth I think the next one in the queue, Warren, is uh, from Luke. And there was a question about, you know, can you combine the physical and the skiing warm up together into one? I think you could probably combine some of them um, for sure. The, uh, you know, our our boots limit us a little bit. So the hopping drills, uh, the squats, you know, you're not going to be able to, you know, our, our boot limits how much our ankle is going to flex. So when I'm in my running shoes or, or just my socks in the day lodge, I can go through a larger range of motion um, to get things warmed up. Absolutely. I would definitely try to find some of those that you can put on on snow, uh, especially now if you're not going to be able to have time inside or you don't have a place to do it at the resort that you're at uh, without moving to a, you know, a section on a run that, that's safe and out of the way. Um, but yeah, look for some of those. But there, there are, like I said, the range of motion is what's really important on those. Awesome. Uh, and Warren, we have one from a younger gentleman here. Uh, Warren, any comments to an 80-year-old regarding tonight's session? <laughs> you know, um, comments towards a, an 80-year-old. I think what becomes most important is that level of intensity. I, and I, you know, I had that, that broken leg not that long ago, a couple of years ago. And I certainly, uh, on it for a couple of reasons. One, physically, I had a hard time making the moves that I needed to make. There are ways that we can modify uh, our technique to, to deal with joints that don't bend as much. Uh, I had the pleasure of skiing with somebody um, who's you know due for a, a hip replacement here pretty soon, just this week. Um, and we found a way to, to, to help him. He couldn't hinge that well at the at the hip laterally um but by giving him a little bit more counter in his skiing that helped him get weight to the outside so there are ways around some of that the other piece is the 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 i guess the mindset that you're going to take into your training day uh, when i was struggling with fear uh, quite a lot of it to be honest after my broken leg no matter even though i knew what move i had to do and when my uh, body was actually physically able to make that same move again. The fear really held me back. And I know that happens uh, to a lot of us as we potentially age. Like I'm, I, you know, I don't jump off 20 foot cliffs anymore. Like I did in my twenties because I'm afraid to get hurt. So that's uh, some of those considerations. I really look at the, uh, that intensity, uh, level of training. And, you know, again, if you're, if you're struggling, with movements that you can't make anymore uh, know what the movement was supposed to do and find you know we could find a workaround uh, for some of those things excellent thanks warren um bill posed one to you and it was just sort of commenting on great approach a big challenge is knowing what movements to add and having a toolbox to draw from his uh his question is sort of specific do you have any suggestions about developing range of movement 
I think that, you know, I, if I'm understanding the question correctly, range in that vertical sense uh, where the legs bend, um, you know, there's the, in, in that, the amount of range required for skiing in the vertical sense is not a ton. Uh, it's there to help us recenter. It's there to help us start that release of our direction change. And it doesn't need to be more, you know, maybe four or five inches. It's really not a ton. Uh, people who tend to be locked up, uh, where we say we need them to bend more, uh, and they're struggling to bend more, as an example, uh, is usually because they're just not balanced on the outside ski. So looking at those components that we talked about tonight, that are going to get us to the outside ski uh, on our three points of contact will likely free up our joints to be able to move. Um, having said that, if you know, if I'm, if I had that student in the in the day lodge and I said, "Hey, can you do a can you do a squat here? How low can you go?" And if they can get down to to ninety degrees uh, without much effort, you know, of course, there's a bit of muscular effort, but if they can actually move that much inside then it's not a physical uh, block, it's a technical block. Excellent, thanks Warren. Um, John Nels has one and regarding video. So you obviously had some video of yourself this evening, but uh, do you video your, yourself and what sort of physical cues do you look for to know you are achieving the movements versus feeling something um, which is sometimes not really reliable? <laughs> yeah, great question. You know, I get video, uh, I video a lot of video last year because I was uh, producing, um, you know, videos for YouTube and, and stuff like that. But uh, so I had an opportunity to delete a lot of runs and only edit the ones that I liked. But yes, uh, lots of video of my own skiing. The knowledge of, again, what move uh, affects the ski in, the, in what you need the ski to do. And in reality, you know, our skis only do two things, right? We can point them where we want to go or twist them on the surface of the snow to do so. Um, or we can tip them over and they'll bend. And, you know, with our wonderful skis that, that are out there these days, um, that creates an arc, right? It creates a, 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 sh a turn shape. So every move, and this goes back to contribution and effect, um, every, if I can't see... Uh, the results of my move, i.e. I don't have video, uh, I need to know what the move is supposed to do for me, and that's what I analyze. Um, we're going to talk quite a lot about that next week, so I won't give away too, too much. You'll have to tune in next week for all the answers to that question. Awesome. And it uh, looks like one final one this evening, uh, unless any others pop up, but uh, I believe as Marshall was asking, to your earlier comment about um adding something adding a piece um oh, and the, the question just jumped on me basically does 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 adding the piece become easier over time um and, and marshall you i'll have to excuse myself here the the question got some extra likes and it jumped off my screen anyways it, it, it the, the question was sort of like does adding that that piece become easier over time as a skier progresses in their ability or because they become, they're becoming more uh, ingrained in their habits and that sort of thing, does, does adding something new become more of a challenge? <laughs> Over it, Everything takes time, absolutely, right? We have to, you know, we go through um, development, you know, from acquiring a new move to consolidating, refining, and, and so on and so forth. And that is a predictable curve that we all go on. The... If you under, if the precision and the intention uh, of your training uh, will, I believe, get you closer to your goals and, and making a, a change or you know adding that piece so it becomes automated to your skiing. The more that we exaggerate, repeat, isolate the the new movement, the faster that we're going to 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 learn it, uh, and also that knowledge of knowing what it's supposed to do for you. If we don't know the, the effect uh, of the move, it's very hard to, to measure, like I was saying earlier. So yeah, over time it does. As we start to uh, experiment and, and change the variables, that is helping our brains uh, learn 
what the you know what this move does for us and over time the more practice we have with it focused practice then the easier our brains are going to find that new uh, connection in the brain and go default to that move as our move for the result again but without that contribution and effect understanding that doesn't happen very very easily so when you add that to your training uh, I think you'll find the addition to your skiing quite easy because looking at those, you know, the three full-time moves and the one part-timer, the three full-time moves I can do, you know, just, I can get up off my couch and and I can do them, you know, just bending sideways, countering a little bit, um, rolling my foot over. I can do that sitting here in my chair right now. And I dare you all to do it and, you know, kind of use the adductor groups of muscles to, you know, think of trying to squeeze your, your legs together. That would be opposing adductor group muscles, but those are all moves that unless you have a serious injury, uh, that most people can do without very, you know, with very little effort. So if the, if the movement is correct, uh, and the approach and the understanding of what it does for us is there, then there's a really good chance you're going to you know, acquire it very quickly. And then the practicing component will allow you to refine it, uh, sorry, consolidate it, and then then refine it. Excellent. And uh, we did get one more speak of the devil. So uh, probably a good way to wrap up. Um, Mark Povetsian is asking about basically taking, taking our students back to the basics and allowing them to fix a problem. So you talked tonight about training um, and, you know, building new moves into people skiing. So Mark's question is your thoughts on taking a student back to the basics and allowing them to fix a problem um, before moving forward. Maybe you can speak to that a little bit. Um, yeah, I think the, you know, basics, if in my understanding of basic, basics and what I would say basics, I think, again, it's those, three full-timers and one part-timer uh, doing that. If you were to go on a gentle green slope, uh, put your skis in a, in a snow plow type shape, right. To give yourself a wide base of support and it creates a little bit more friction. Uh, ski tips are, are pointing across the hill opposing uh, you know, of course. Um, but you know, and if I just simply uh, connected to the outside ski you know, using that movement pattern that we talked about here, um, that would give you a, a slight change of, of direction. Um, I wouldn't uh, change you know, uh, the, the terrain or the variable until, again, I understand the move and what it does for me. Adding to the answer I gave before about the feeling, you know, you know the, everybody will feel uh, a result of their move slightly differently, even if they made the exact same move. Uh, so, you know, the, the feeling is a may or may not have, but the outcome of that move is a is you have it or you don't have it, and uh, so analyzing that as you go to me that's what going back to the basics is. You can do it in a wedge, you can do it at at slower speeds. Again, that's one of the variables uh, in in the the training and the the performance component. Awesome, uh, Warren, and, and to everyone who's still on the line, we had over five hundred registered for tonight. Uh, there's still 200 with us right now, so I'd like to thank everybody who uh, um, who's hung out and and followed through with some Q and A. Um, if you missed the first portion of the uh, this evening, I had a couple of comments in the chat. You will receive a link to this recording. It typically takes a couple of hours for the video to uh, to load up, and then you'll receive a uh, an email with a link to that. So check it out. Um, if you'd like, uh, contact us on uh, the CSI Ontario social feeds. We can get you the link to the first video um, as well from session last week. We do have one more of these coming your way again next week, and we'd love to see you back out. Registration for that will go live uh, very soon. And anybody who's signed up for any of the sessions so far will get an email notification about that. And while you're still with us, if you are uh, if you have not yet checked out in the handouts, especially for the members coming from Ontario, um, we do have some information there for you about our scholarship and bursary program. Um, so we'd love to find some ways to help you pursue your training and your courses and certification uh, goals this season. So uh, CSA Ontario partnering up with the National Office to extend the scholarship program here in Ontario and also launching a bursary program that is aimed at helping with some of the training costs, travel costs and other costs that go along with taking a course. 
Um, so something definitely worth checking out, as well as uh, a little bit of information there about our partnership here with um, Good Life Fitness. And if you haven't looked at that information there, it's up for you. Warren's info about tonight's session, uh, his handout will get posted uh, as soon as possible. It'll be available for you at the third session as well, so you can look back. Really hope you enjoyed tonight, and we'll look forward to seeing you again next week. Keep an eye open for uh, registration going live, and we'll do this all over again at Tech Talk number three with Warren as our presenter next week. Thanks so much for being here, and we will talk soon. Thanks, everyone.